Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our summer strategy session. We're so happy that you were able to make it here with us. And of course, if you're watching this on the replay, we're happy that you watched the replay. <laughs> and we're happy that you made it here with us as well. So before we get started, I want to introduce our panelists and of course our host organization. Um, in case you don't know this, is being hosted and organized by the Black Homeschoolers of Central Florida, which is a nonprofit organization that is over 10 years old, located in Central Florida. They've been around for a while, and if you don't know about them, you should learn. They have a big community expo that happens. Uh, this year it's going to be in February, on February 26, 2022. It is open to the public, it is free, and you are more than welcome to join us. Okay, uh, so let's meet our panelists, our fantastic panelists. Let's start. Okay, we have Sister Amira Bello. Okay, let's, where's she? Oh, there she is, Sister Amira Bello. Let's put her up so you guys can see her. Okay, she is a teacher, a homeschooling, educating mom, and an abacus math advocate, which I love the abacus. I might have sitting on the floor for my son. <laughs> She also spent a lot of time in, in Japan, and through doing that, she was able to see why maybe some students don't have some foundational things that they need to have in order to be successful. And he also provides tools to build strong math foundations. So can you tell us what's your company? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my company is called Mathematician Junior. Very good. So, so we're going to have uh, some expert information from Mathematician Junior. And of course, you guys will get the links and everything from that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Let's also look at Sister U our Uriah Stewart. Let's get her up. Did you love her hair, guys? She looks flat. <laughs> she is the business manager of Gifted and Lit, which is a music fun based educational program. And if your kids are like my kids, where they memorize just about any hip hop song that they hear and they can spit back those lyrics, then they probably would do very well with Gifted and Lit. Okay. So, can you tell us a little bit about your company? Sure, sure. So my name is Arita and um, the company is uh, we use culturally responsive curriculum to promote social emotional learning through song, through music to get the whole family engaged in learning. Very good. And I can tell you guys, I have heard some of those videos and they are catchy. <laughs> Excellent. And then we have Miss Lorraine Tomac. OK, she is a veteran homeschool mom. She hosted the very first um homeschool college fair in tampa bay because a lot of times people think that homeschoolers don't go to college yes we do <laughs> right so she hosted the very first one um there in tampa bay she's the founder of on track which is a faith-based teen leadership program to help students get experiences also to volunteer and help others okay so Ms. tim mac how do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what you do Sure. Again, my name is Lorraine Tomic, and I am the founder of Homeschool Builders. Basically, what I do is I help new and struggling homeschoolers um, kind of get back on track. I know that it's kind of overwhelming in the very beginning, and sometimes we kind of get lost on, on in our journey, and it's hard to make that vision reality, and that's mm -hmm. what I do. I offer online workshops and coaching. Very good. And trust me, we all feel like we can uh, use that at some times. And of course, I am going to be leading the panel. My name is Yolanda Newton. I am from Education Revolution. I'm a homeschool mom. I am a professional educator. Before I even became a mom, I loved education. I'm a big fat nerd. I am an author. <laughs> I am. I'm an author and a big advocate of the humanities and soft skills, which we'll talk about during our session. So there we go. You guys know who we are and why we're here to talk to you. Now, as an FYI, if you post a little uh, anything in the comment section, it will actually come to us if you're here with us live. If you have a question, something like pressing that you really want either the panel or one specific panelist to answer, we will do that live. OK, you just need to put it in. And of course, we're going to give you guys contact information for how to follow up in case something comes to you later. OK, so ladies, let's start our conversation. 
Uh, let's talk about the mindset, because I know that this, you know, a lot of us talked about uh, helping our families. And we, we all talked about families because it's not something that happens in isolation when we homeschool. It is a community affair. It's a family affair. And it really does involve our mindset before we start. Okay. Uh, and it for it being emotional. Okay. Not just saying, oh, this is all educational. So I remember Lorraine, you actually had a really good point that you brought out. Um, you noted that your success in schooling is related to your success in parenting. I remember you said that. So I'm going to I'm going to bring you up and all of us are going to going to talk a little bit about this, but that one kind of struck out to me. What do you mean by that? Well, school uh, homeschooling is not school at home. You know, school is an extension of what's going on in your home and the relationships and the, the dynamics that are already there. So the more success uh, let's put it this way, your your success as a parent or your confidence um, as a parent will translate and cross over into how you educate your parent, not only your children, but how they respond to you. And um, I remember when I first started homeschooling, my my daughter was who was third grade at the time. You know, she thought it was going to be we're sitting at home, we're going to be watching Disney, we're going to be having all this fun. And mm -hmm. when she realized she was really going to be doing schoolwork and we started doing multiplication and all of these things, she went from calling me mom to Mrs. Harrigan, which was my <laughs> name at the time. <laughs> And so she was like, okay, so on the days that she called me Mrs. Harrigan was the days that she let me know she was not in the mood to homeschool <laughs> and she did not appreciate me trying to stay on task, you know. Oh, no. uh, but, it, but, but um, you know, but that being said, this is an awesome opportunity to really learn your children, to really know your children and to get them to know you as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to uh, really incorporate some positive discipline because that doesn't always happen in the school systems. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah. one of the, the, the series that I teach, I do go into discipline as a positive thing. And, and I'm talking about ways in which we can motivate our children um, to want to learn and also to um, help with some of those challenging behaviors. So um, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Very often we hear that word um, discipline, discipline and we yes. think, oh, that means. And you know what? I'm humanity. So I'm like, you know, the word discipline and punishment are not the same because they're not no. the same thing. Absolutely. Okay, that discipline is a good thing to have discipline. Yes. That's, that's excellent. I love that. So Sister Mira, you said something else interesting because you went specifically to your area and you talked about math. You said that math is emotional. And I mean, I do remember crying over a math textbook, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's what you meant. So let me, <laughs> let me pull you up. Absolutely. Go ahead, tell us what do you mean by that? Absolutely. If you don't mind, before I <clears throat> go ahead. My question, my girls were in a swim competition, so I'm a little bit hoarse because I was screaming. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I want to just touch on a little bit of what uh, Sister Lorraine said. Of course. She made a really good point um, about your mindset like the original question uh, my whole journey started with my mindset and my mindset was i'm terrible in math i'm terrible i was terrible yeah. in math my entire academic career so fortunately for me the way i'm wired i said i have to make it different for my girls right um but a lot of times when parents are not cognizant about what their emotion is related to reading or math then you tend to either go in that direction with your children or you go away from that direction. So there's all these statistics out with um, the time that parents spend with children at home and about 70% of that are, uh, focus on ELA and, and those types of activities and the yeah. rest are all other subjects. <laughs> your sciences and your math. So I think it really is important to really kind of gauge where your thinking is about every subject what mm -hmm. your own emotion and what your own experiences in school were with that subject. If you were a math person, guess what? You're going to have fun with math. You're going to say, hey, kids, come on, it's time to do math. And if you mm -hmm. struggle with reading, you'll be like, okay, all right, let's 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 get to reading. They're going to sense that. Mm -hmm. They're going to sense your right. own emotional like you know, experiences with those subjects. So I think Sister Lorraine made a really good point about being very cognizant of what your own experiences, what yes. they have rendered to how you are today yeah. and how that yes. comes out when you 
um, when you are engaged with your children because our kids sense it. Nothing it doesn't yeah, have to be exactly. verbal. Yeah, yeah. Um, which mm-hmm. does relate to the question that you brought up, Yolanda, in terms of math is emotional. So oftentimes when we, you know, when we do reading, we read a story, we read about emotions, or we do science, mm-hmm. we do an experiment is like, wow, there's all this positive emotion around a lot of these subjects. And when it gets to math, it becomes really rote, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so one plus another, we become yeah. serious. And it doesn't have to be the case. So when I engage and I, and I do my courses with my students, um, and even with my children, we made stories about numbers, right? Yeah. Like we, we, we talked about the, the, you know, we talked about, you know, 550 and 500 specifically, but we made stories about them. We made stories about how they're lonely and then other numbers have to come together to be their friends. And, and so we make it emotional because like our that. children remember that stuff. They remember exactly. songs, every hip hop song. Um, they remember the story about stuff. They remember exactly. these things. Which is why you know people really advocate making history less sterile, right? Let's just not talk about facts and dates. Let's talk about the backstory. So numbers have backstories too, and yeah. when you get the backstory of the number, you talk about some numbers being sad when you, you know, when you take them apart, you subtract, they might be sad or this or that. You know, then kids remember that, like, oh, let's give the five back and add it to four to make nine happy, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. we, we don't add enough, or we don't make. Um, we don't make stories and we don't add emotionality to what math looks like uh, enough. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, and I completely agree. I remember when you when we had our little mini sessions getting ready for this, when you talked about it, I was like, yeah, I, I completely agree because I'm very big into you don't teach things in isolation. So giving them that story, I yeah, they're going to remember, especially if that's something they're into. I love that. Excellent. All right. So. She knows I'm coming to her next. (laughs) Narita said that learning should be engaging um, and it should incite the learners, right? So again, we're talking about emotion. What did you mean by that? So um, I, I am a, I'm a big personality person. And so I like, you know, I talk with my hands, you know, I'm, I'm very um, engaging myself. And so what I noticed, I have four children and I taught all of them at home, not necessarily in a homeschool setting, but whatever I saw that was not being given at school, we then had school at home. And so every day of the week, we did something as a family. So Tuesday was sign language, I think it was, and Wednesday was Bible study, and Thursday was, uh, let me think, what was Thursday? I think Thursday was, I remember Friday was movie night, Saturday was African and African American history night, and science was science Sunday. And so we did all of these things together, and so when Amir's talking about it has to be emotional, there has to be a story behind it, um, I would, I make games all the time about anything, you know? And so when I was teaching them the periodic table at, what was it, third and fourth grade or or second and fourth grade, they're like, oh yeah, I want to know more. And mm-hmm. it's because you act out what the molecules do. Like, I'm, I'm how do you, how does, how does water saturate sugar? Well, let's look at the molecules. You guys be molecules and, and surround, like it has to be engaging. There has to be that story. There has to be that emotion for them to understand it. Like there, there's, when you connect the dots for them and then give it to them, they have this full comprehensive understanding of what it is that you want them to know. But just giving them those facts, just giving them mm-hmm. those, you know, those those very boring, those very blase concepts, it, it doesn't work for us, you know? So <laughs> why would it work for children? So learning has to be engaging. You have to incite them to want to intrinsically learn for themselves. Um, I hate the fact that a lot of what school has become is teaching for tests. We're no longer teaching for life. We're no longer teaching those life skills and the fact Mm -hmm. that you see math outside your window. Like it's it's not just one plus one is two. Um, And so, so yeah, so learning has to be engaging. You have to, the whole family needs to be involved. You know, it's not just the student as the learner, but your whole family should be able to get in on this exciting learning experience because learning can be fun if you just know how to engage your audience. So 
I like that. I like how you said they're they're your audience. I like that because they kind of are. I know one of the things for me um, with mindset was resilience. OK. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's not going to be easy. So I don't care if you come to this session and every session that you go to and get all these fantastic ideas. I, I don't even know each one of these four experts, individual stories, but I can tell you one thing. Each one of them had something that worked and something that didn't work. <laughs> something that they right. tried and it was like, oh, no, this is not going to work for the kids. It's not going to work for me. It doesn't work. And we don't want to get discouraged. Right. So before we even start with me, with the mindset and the emotion of it is to steal ourselves up also so that our kids can see that, you know, mm -hmm. I, my, my kids, my sons know I will switch it if it is not working and I don't feel like a failure. That's right. what that's what life is about. So mm -hmm. with me also having that mindset is gearing myself up and knowing that some things are going to work fantastically. Some things are not going to work fantastically. And whatever it is, we need to change. It doesn't mean that I'm a failure as an educator or as a mom, just mm -hmm. like it's not going to be their failure if they don't catch that, that, um, that concept right away. Right away. They're right. not a failure. You're not right. a failure. We just need to build that resilience so that we can keep going. Um, mm -hmm. And then it just makes everything, it makes it easier to have fun when you're mm -hmm. learning, when you realize, you know, every failure is one step closer to success, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. So we're all engaged for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about some strategies that might help brand new. Now we're going to talk about homeschoolers who need to switch up. Maybe they've been around a while, but there's been a huge influx of people who are starting their homeschool journey just either because they want to, or maybe um, the most recent pandemic put them in a position to try it. And they're like, you know, we're going to stick it out. And mm -hmm. they're looking for suggestions. They're looking for advice. How do I, how do I make this happen? Okay, so I want you guys to think for a second about um, what would you tell a new homeschool uh, educator, a new homeschool parent, and you need to give them a piece of advice as they start on their journey. What would you tell them? Okay, and I'm gonna pull everybody up because we're all kind of equal when we think about this. Okay, does anybody have any, any advice for them? What I do. do. I have, I have one thing. <laughs> Um, I would definitely say do not educate in isolation. You need to, you know, reach out for your resources, reach out for mentorship, reach out for help. It is, um, I, I believe uh, Sister Lorraine was saying this before, you know, you, I don't want to mince your words, sister, but um, you were, you were talking about, you know, everybody struggles, you know, and, and sometimes you lose your way and, Yolanda, like you said, it's not that you failed as an educator. It's not that you failed as a parent. You just need to reach out to learn what you don't know. And what a better way to model for your students how to learn by reaching out and asking for help. So my advice would be don't educate in isolation, but definitely reach out for the resources and the helps that you'll need as an educator. I like that. Of course. I'm, I'm sorry if you wanted to go, but I, so to kind of offer a counterbalance, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, reach out for the areas that you are not strong in, but don't forget to capitalize on the areas where you do have strength. Right? Absolutely. So regardless mm -hmm. what it is, because my preference is to say home educate and not home school particularly because i um, I, I believe sister lauren said at the beginning she said there's a very strong distinction between you know school at right. home and yeah home school. yeah at home it is educating we're educating our child because there's a huge difference schooling that's that teaching towards the test right typically we right mm -hmm. my father always used to tell me i send you to school to get schooled that's what happens at school you get schooled, mm -hmm. but at home we educate you here this is where your yes. education is and so your strength regardless what it is if you are a marketing expert if you are agriculturalist if you are a mechanic whatever it is maximize that right right because, mm -hmm. again we're talking about emotionality so if you are very passionate about making sure that you know mm -hmm. these cars are together, bring your child. That's that's how we used to have these generational kind of businesses because right. our children took over. Yes. Our children have right. not only our knowledge base, but they brought in more knowledge base. Right. So 
capitalize it off of it. Like, don't stop. If you're starting, don't get frozen or don't stop your progress because you're not sure what to do next. Figure out what you love. If you love to bake, then you know what, y'all? Let's bake all. Let's, let's do every kind of baking. Let's learn about the different temperatures. Let's like, because mm -hmm. we, we tend to forget our own value when we come mm -hmm. to home. Yeah. We feel like, you know, because homeschooling parents are the parents that spend the most, right? Where the reality is, we don't necessarily have to. We can just kind of dig in deep and just start with where your your, your area of, of strengths are. Um, and that's a start. And the other like kind of token somebody gave me years ago, they just said, you decide what you want your child to know and make sure they know it, right? Like you decide, you choose. Mm. If I want my children to know every type of plant that's in our yard and in our neighborhood and mm -hmm. be able to name it, and like that, make that your project. For the next few weeks so you decide you own what you want your their education to be and don't feel as though you have to necessarily be tied to this curriculum that's out there these state standards these common core standards because if you look at america's education system i'm not going to talk about it you can look up <laughs> but, 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 but one thing that it is saying about our educational system is that it goes a mile wide and it's a quarter inch deep. i know that's oh i yes, get that yes so, yes yes, yes. Oh, I like that. A mile wide and a quarter inch deep. I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> Very good. All right, Ms. Serene, I know you want to piggyback, so let me pull yes. you on up. Um, yes. Um, I know that when you first start to homeschool, you're going to be very tempted to look at what other people are doing. And the temptation to compare is going to be very great. And you're wanting, because you're unsure and you're wanting to gauge what you're doing. But that is the killer of creativity. That is mm -hmm. the creator, the killer of joy, and that is the the killer of all things good. Um, <laughs> I remember when I started homeschooling. You know, I, it was enough for me to get my daughters and I uh, just to the table and homeschooling, and we mm -hmm. were a part of a support group. And here comes, you know, a fellow homeschooler. She was baking bread from scratch and from her garden, and you know, everyone was matching, and everyone, you know, looked perfectly squeaky clean and it was like I'm failing <laughs> we're, we're not doing so good I you know I barely remember to buy bread from the supermarket never mind bake it from scratch but and even if you're comparing against the school system you know um, you know a lot of times we're tempted to make homeschool look like school we have to have subjects we have to switch every so often depending on the method that you choose that may be what your homeschool look like but it doesn't have to be do not limit yourself the world is your classroom exactly. as opposed to going to a school building and you're confined by the walls and right. whatever that instructor feels is important for it to, to be you know um, broadcasted yeah. Yeah. but man look out of your window look at tv where everywhere you look is a potential classroom there is yeah. teachable moments everywhere yeah. um yeah. some days you're going to be firing at all, all on all five cylinders and you're going to be mm -hmm. like yeah i rock at this and some days mm -hmm. it's going to be like oh my goodness i wish you know you're going to press that snooze button and you, you mm -hmm. just <laughs> go through the day wondering okay i don't know but yeah. you give yourself a break and and because what you're endeavoring to do is um is is pretty big you know we're here to support you we understand what you're going through some days are going to be great some days aren't going to be great but you forgive those days you you get past those days you take a deep breath and say you know what tomorrow's another day mm -hmm. and yeah. you keep on going you know, uh, we talked about um, failure just a few moments ago, and you know, when, when I grew up, failure was not was not a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. um, but failure is to be embraced, even if it teaches you what not to do. You've learned a lesson. You have now got information mm -hmm. that you can work on to reach whatever that goal is. And my favorite saying that I, I say to my children is, "I'd rather fail than quit." You know, because if you mm -hmm. quit, you'll never hit the mark. But there really is nothing wrong with failure if you know how to manage it and you use it as a learning point and not as a a judgment. You well, know, like and who you are. You, you got your sisters are really deep. <laughs> go ahead, no, go ahead. My my son used to struggle a lot with failure. And I used to always tell him, failure is not a bad thing. It means you have the courage to try something that you didn't know how to do. And so I created an acronym for him. Fail just means your first attempt in learning. That's it. 
So mm-hmm. keep failing until you succeed. But at least you had the courage to try something that you may not have been comfortable with. You may not have learned or knew how to do when you started. It's it's just an attempt. That's all it is. So keep failing until you succeed. Oh, I, you know, I'm taking notes and I, I put this in the <laughs> chat and I put that down because I'm like, oh, we can make a poster out of that. <laughs> my house, my son. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I like that. Um, I will tell you guys, too, when I think about one of the things that I see that kind of uh, gets me, it, it kind of goes with the comparing and the comparison. Um, it is when I see a, a home educator uh, parent start and their first question is to ask everyone else what they do, mm-hmm. what they use. Now, there's nothing wrong with gathering resources. I mean, there. I'm, I'm going to be real. I've heard of these ladies before. And if you go out there and you ask for advice, they're going to tell you about these ladies and what they do because they're good at what they do, right? But the thing with comparison of, of ourselves is a lot of times we don't take into account what goes on behind the scenes. So what I mean by that is like Lorraine, she's talking about that. I'm laughing because I actually do fake bread. Um, (laughs) Right. Right. But what you may not know after, you know, you say my sons go, oh, yeah, mom taught us how to bake bread. That's fantastic. What you don't know is that mom doesn't start school until this time. I have this. I have like all the other stuff that goes around what we do. Mm -hmm. So one of the pieces of advice that I very often give to newbies is not just to look at, well, what curriculum is out there that might work for my kid? I ask them, well, what curriculum is out there that's also going to work for you? And what I mean by that is when you talk about what style you have, I'll be real. My style is not, it's very flexible, but there is some regiment in it. That goes with my personality. Okay, Mm -hmm. and then I have other friends who their their kids do all kinds of other stuff and they're just like free spirits. And you know what? Both of those are right. They -hmm. work for each individual family. So when Mm -hmm. you look at it, don't don't just ask, hey, what are you using? Okay, ask them, why is it working for you? What do you like about it? So you can see if it aligns with what your family is and what your family wants to do. Okay, because every homeschool family is different. Every one of our goals is different. We don't look the same. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't. And I love the one talking about learning. I think it was um, Sister Amira who was talking about learning and, and how there's generational learning and growth that goes with it. Because part of our homeschool, which would probably be very weird to people, is beat matching. And they'd be like, what is that? My husband is a professional is a professional entertainer and he sits at home and does stuff that people pay lots of money for. And my sons are in the background going, hmm, that's that many beats per minute with that many beats per minute. And they go together. That's part of the school. And trust me, it's worth money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's worth money. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Does anybody want to follow up with any other strategies? And also remember, if you're here live, you can jump in and ask a question. We'll see it and we'll answer. Um, I and- Something that was said that made me think about years ago, I'm based in Atlanta and I went to the Atlanta um, Historical Society. Uh, They have some homes from um, the middle 1700s, early 1800s. And one of the artifacts they have on display is a a textbook, right? Like a a Uh textbook work. And in that textbook laid open, you know, that handwritten print, the lesson for that season, right? The season, mm-hmm. the growing season, was to measure cotton. I'm in Georgia. Right. To measure the growth <laughs> of cotton, of, of different um, rows of cotton based on the uh, based on the treatment, like how much they watered or what mm. they did to it. And this was the school book. This was in, in a schoolhouse. This was mm-hmm. their learning. So pertaining to that time, their environment, what they had to do, like their textbooks correlated directly to their life. Life And I just found that amazing. Mm -hmm. It was was enlightening and it was saddening at the same time because if you pull many of the textbooks that you might find in a school, many times it doesn't correspond to whatever our life looks like or what our children need to do to function optimally in their lives around them, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So just kind of thinking about and going back to the conversation about how do I start? How do I start this homeschooling journey? 
think about the life that your children have. We don't know what's going to be happening next year, year, but think about what they do now. Mm -hmm. What would be great if they knew right now, what they understood right now about how's a car work or what might coding be or why is my oven to come on or not or what's turning, what's causing the, the lights on the refrigerator to come on. You know, like there are all of these things that, um, you know, pertain directly to life where if they learn the whys behind them, you mm -hmm. know, it can help with just getting your journey started. Mm -hmm. um, I would have my mm -hmm. go around and just ask, ask, just ask about stuff, just because I don't mm -hmm. even know the questions in their head. And they come up with all kinds of things. Why are there springs in the couch? And I'm like, why are there springs in the couch? <laughs> <laughs> Again, just having a good question could be the beginning of like a 10,000 step journey that could take you to all kinds of places, the physics and math Absolutely. and literature. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I like that. Kids are really good at asking those questions and we're sitting there going, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and trust me, for, for some of you newbies, you will quickly find out that not everything that you do is a, it ends up being, I pre-plan this. Right. right. A lot of times it's their question and you go, yes. oh yes. no, you know what, we're going to figure yes. this out. And, yes. and you let it, you let it move you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So let's look at, we talked about homeschoolers who are just starting. But then we also have those who may need to make some adjustments. So they've been around and they've been doing things and maybe either something is not working or honestly, one of the reasons a lot of times people make adjustments is depending on what the student wants to do, okay? Because they may switch gears or they may age to a different point where they need to do certain things as they prep for certain goals that they have in life, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of advice would you give to an established, I've been homeschooling, did it last year, did it the year before that, but I need to switch it up. How would you give them advice as they decide to figure out how they're going to make any changes? What would you tell them? Hmm. Yeah. Well, it would depend on the, the type of changes that or what the issues are. One of the things that I do with, um, with new and with uh, struggling homeschoolers is that I have them create a mission statement because that gives them their why. Some, sometimes we had talked about it earlier about getting lost in the process. Um, you know, identifying what the, the disconnect is. is. Is it the curriculum? Is it the way that I'm presenting the information? Is there, are they not receiving it? Am I on grade level? Do, is there, you know, really just identifying what those things are. Um, but sometimes, um, well, not sometimes, but every time when a mission statement is done, the process of creating it and understanding why we're homeschooling, mm -hmm. who we're homeschooling, um, and and what their needs are, a lot of times that can prevent some of those problems because once the mission statement is completed and I've worked through the night, that's a, a class that I teach as well. Um, now we have a foundation for, for making all the other decisions. So before I pick that curriculum, you know, if, if I go to my vision, um, my, my vision or my mission statement, you know, okay, this is what I said that I wanted to, the opportunities I want to create for my child as a homeschooler. These are the values that I want to relate to my ch child. Mm -hmm. um, these are the things that I, I know that my child needs to accomplish or these are the needs of my child. And so when we make um, decisions for like my daughters and my, I had one daughter who had a learning disability. And so, um, you know, at first I was just doing regular, well, regular homeschooling with her and, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's, expecting her to just fall mm -hmm. in line with what the curriculum right. was asking. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, when I realized that she was having an issue with that, we went ahead and got her seen by a learning um, specialist um, and we were able to identify what the need was. And it wasn't that we didn't need, we didn't need to change up what I was presenting to her, but how I was presenting it to her right. mm -hmm. and giving her that extra time to read, um, ensuring that she was do doing what she needed to do to comprehend. We studied with a dictionary next to us at all times. That way, if there was a word she didn't understand, we can look it up, we can rephrase it, you know, and just doing things that she needed done so that she could um, move forward. Um, but 
I find that doing that, I didn't do a mission statement. The way I, I kind of got thrown into homeschool, although I've always wanted to, there was a situation that took place at the school that kind of forced my hand. And so mm -hmm. for that first year, as I was learning it, as I was doing it, um, mm -hmm. you know, I realized where a mission statement would have been so valuable had it been presented to me or if I thought to do one. So like just that. Back to the basics and your why, why you do you know why you're doing what you're doing um and then just being very observant if it's an issue where again it's a curriculum thing or the child is having an, a hard time with a concept are they ready for that concept you mm -hmm. know is there was there pre-work that needed to be done mm -hmm. very good i love that okay, okay. Definitely. definitely what anybody else want to add anything if you as you give them advice I, um to change up I would have a similar sentiment, um, really hone in on, depending upon the age of your children or your child, like what their passions are. Um, I find when you are fortunate enough to have a child be passionate about something, um, to try to open every opportunity within that passion. I had a friend who's um, son was just into airplanes. He started when he was young, he just look at them and he always wanted to see them. And then she found a pilot program for children. That That's cool. And yeah, and he's, a, he's like this pilot who trains pilots now. Um, so don't discount their passion. Don't disca discount the things that um, they find a lot of natural interest and natural curiosity. Just try as much as you can to build their capacity. And that does go to uh, it does you, you might have to seek external kind of resources or experiences to, to, to help kind of cultivate that but um you know just just identify those passions and identify those interests and try to build on them because that so oftentimes is a pathway that might lead to their other successes mm -hmm. i like that that's very good i mean and it's true a lot of times we look at those things and it really it doesn't matter if that their passion is the airplanes and you go, OK, but if they learn about airplanes all day, when are they going to learn reading? Um, hello. Trust me. They'll be more inspired to read things about something they're interested in. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about that. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need to worry about that. OK. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have any more thoughts on switching up? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off of what Sister Amira was saying. Um, be ready to understand that their passion may not be your passion. That our children, while they come from us, they are not us. And so what I have seen with some people is that they struggle because they had this idea of who their child was going to be and how they would learn and what they would be interested in. And so one caution is just remember that they are their own person. They have their own passions, their own giftings, their own talents. And we are there to serve as their guide into the full passion, the full gifting, the full talent. Um, so I just, I wanted to say that. But then the other thing that I wanted to say is um, don't be committed to a mistake just because you spent time investing in that mistake. Mm -hmm. Like I saw that, I think it was on Facebook someplace and I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. We we don't have to commit to that mistake, whether it was a mistake in curriculum, whether it was um, a mistake in methodology, whatever the mistake is. Um, Yolanda, I think you were saying earlier in the in the in the show, be willing to switch it up. Mm -hmm. If it's what the child needs, if it's what your child needs, and if it's easier for you, sometimes my mom always tells me, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to do what's easier for you. Mm -hmm. So if it's easier for you, switch up. Don't feel guilty about that. Lose that guilt. Because if it's easier for you, sometimes it's better for the child because you then have more passion about doing it. You then have more availability, more creativity that's flowing through you for them to understand what it is that's being taught. So those are the two things that I just wanted to add. I, I'm typing these notes as fast as I can. because <laughs> This is good stuff. And I, I completely agree. Um, one of the things I think about when when someone goes, I want to switch it up. One of those first things is, I know it's like the kids. I'm like, why? I'm not questioning you to say don't switch it. I'm just wondering if it's not working because we don't want to make the same mistake. Oh, well, it was right. too rigid, and then they go from one thing that's rigid to another thing that's rigid. 
Mm-hmm. I think you might turn into the same same uh, problem. So mm-hmm. I, I really do like the concept of just taking a second. I like the the statement idea too that Lorraine came up with. Mm-hmm. Why am I doing this? Because then I can line up like a mirror. This is what I want. This is what I have. What's not working? So then at least it can help direct you as you make your, your next set of decisions. And don't get overwhelmed and feel like, well, I feel like a failure because they're doing it, but it doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because that's life. That's life. It's, okay. it's not going to always work for everyone the same thing. They may be looking at you and something you do and going, wow, they can do that, but I can't work. Doesn't work for me. That's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that's okay. Excellent. Now we've talked broad. We're going to take a couple minutes and talk very specific about our um, what we're into because we all kind of have our little our little niche and what we're into. Um, Sister Mayor, I'm going to start with you, okay, uh, with math. Okay, so if you're sitting here going, okay, great, can you help me with math? Okay, mm-hmm. here we go. Okay, why don't you give us some ideas, perhaps about as they start their school year and line things up. What should they keep in mind in relation to math and making sure that they set up their student to be successful um, in mathematics? Sure. Um, my broad advice would be use a manipulative or use several manipulatives. Use manipulatives that re- relate directly to what you're doing in math. Um, kids need to do, they need to touch, they need to feel. Um, so most of our children, just looking at statistics, are kinesthetic learners. They're not going to learn just by seeing. Uh, they're going to learn by manipulating and touching and feeling and remembering the experience. So you want to make sure you have a thing, right? A physical thing. Um, so specifically, um, mathematician juniors I co-founded uh, was an abacus-based math curriculum for the very young. Um, as as Yolanda said in the beginning, I spent some time in Japan, and I got to see these really young little children, like preschoolers, doing big math, because all they were doing were manipulating beads. And I was just like, that's it. So um, I kind of recreated and simplified an abacus kind of for the American appetite, since it's something that's not familiar to us. And it makes math movement. One of the things that I say is I take the math out of the math, right? You don't need numbers to calculate. And so think about kind of thinking outside this frame of what math looks like, right? The way that you taught math doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. And most certainly the way that um, we teach math in America or in this Western hemisphere is not the best way. Um, So... I have a simplified abacus where children simply move beads that the bead position relates to numbers. So I say, well, children can identify numbers, and they can identify numbers, and they can just move. I have five-year-olds and six-year-olds in some of my virtual classes who are doing algebra. If you have to manipulate a number and change it from nine to six, and you manipulate it physically, that means you can conceptualize that. And, and be able to know what numbers you manipulate. So my advice, I just kind of wrap this up. Use tools, use tools, whether they're tools that you buy, whether they're tools that kids find outside, or whether it's something like a simplified abacus that um, I provide, make sure you are using tools. Make sure, as I said earlier, tell stories. When you introduce one, two, three, that's something, but tell the relationship between one and three. One of the things I love to share with children are these jokes about numbers. And one is like, why is six afraid of seven? So you jokes and they will remember that and they'll remember, oh, seven, eight, nine, the sequence and nine is larger. You know, so there's a lot of kind of things outside of the box that you should be considering when you are introducing what they call numeracy. Everybody knows about literacy, right? How letters come together in four words and the relationship between letters and sounds. But we don't talk enough about numeracy, those early math development um, strategies that children should know to give them a strong foundation. And that's where my passion comes from. Just I wanted to give my daughter this strong foundation in math, whether mm-hmm. that math was something that came naturally to them or not. Mm-hmm. To give them a strong foundation so they never fear the subject as I did all throughout my academic career. You said math, I started, you know, shaking in my boots. So um, those would be the, the the areas of advice related to math that... I love that. A- absolutely. And that's true. We often hear about literacy, but not very often hear about numeracy. And I like that you're looking at those foundational skills. And I mean, yeah, your kid might at this point be in algebra, but you can still go back 
And I, I call it for my kids, I call it number sense, like just understanding how it works, you know, and that's huge. That is huge. I love that. All right. Let's see. Miss Lorraine, I know you have some advice. She's like, oh, oh, me. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, I know you have some great advice. We're all into it. I'm sitting here making notes. Uh -huh. Okay, I need, to get my, I need to get my son in math junior so he can. <laughs> all right. right. Miss Lorraine. Right. Here you go. What advice would you give uh, when you think about what you work on with students? Understanding the student that I'm working with. Um, we talked about it a little bit in the last question. Understanding um, not just their, their passions, but that, that does, um, you can use that, you know, um, to your advantage, but understanding their needs as a student and understanding their their that they have needs as an individual. You know, in the school systems, you know, we were numbers and, and our kids continue to be, you know, numbers or whoever's in the public school system. But at home, they're an individual. Mm -hmm. They're a person with gifts. There are persons with infinite value. Um, we have an opportunity to speak to the heart, mind, and um, the body, mind, and soul of a student. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not just trying to reach them on an academic, but we have an opportunity to really reach them on so many different levels and understanding where they are on those levels, understanding what their needs are and mm -hmm. speaking to those needs. You, you, you speak to that student. They're automatically going to gravitate to what you're presenting and to what you have to offer to them, you know, um, as you're teaching them. Um, so that's how I approach with uh, right now I'm assisting my my children because they're the second generation. My grandchildren are the second generation of homeschool kids. And so um, one of them is not on the regular school um, schedule. So they're visiting with me right now and I'm helping with homeschooling and he has special needs. He's been um, diagnosed with ADHD. And so I understand one. I, it's helping me with my patients <laughs> and, and under, you know, and I, it requires, it requires that I get into his mind and I get into, you know, where he's coming from in order to reach him. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll, it's going to take, I know that I can't just say things one time. I know mm -hmm. that we're not going to transition from subject to subject within a minute or two. I understand that, you know, there are certain things that comes with homeschooling an ADHD child. And once you understand what those needs are um, and you respect those needs, your, ch your child will, they will respond. They will respond. I love that. I got to get that last little bit in. <laughs> that is fantastic. Okay, excellent. All right. So now I'm going to slide over to... Uh, I'm sorry, dancing for gifted, gifted and lit. <laughs> Did somebody want to add something? I'm sorry. Okay, I'm gonna start dancing for gifted and lit. So go ahead, <laughs> slide out on them. Tell, give them, give them a little knowledge. <laughs> so my advice is to simply make it engaging, make it um, exciting to a degree. I always tell my kids, everything is not going to be exciting. You are gonna have to learn how to create the excitement within yourself. But I definitely would encourage um, us as as teachers to make things engaging. And we can do that in so many ways. Um, make it life applicable, like Sister Amira was saying before. Show them how it relates to their life. Um, show them, like Sister Lorraine was saying, show them where the why is. The why is, why are you learning this? Why is this important? Why is this something that you're going to need later mm -hmm. on. Um, when when you're able to do all that, you're able to actually create an excitement inside the learner and they become intrinsically interested in what they are learning. And that's going to motivate them more so than we ever could. Mm -hmm. So definitely um, make it engaging, make it life applicable and show them the why. My son is asking why all the time. My son is 16. Um, he has, um, he was in the beginning of being identified as ADHD. My mom always tells me I have ADHD. So the why is important for us. Like what, yeah. like, why am I, why am I doing this? So definitely, um, sister learn, like you were saying before, you got to know your learner, you got to know where they're at in their head. Um, and then learn their strengths, learn their abilities, 
Learn their challenges and help them to understand that your challenges are just that. They are not weaknesses that destroy you as a person. They don't take away from who you are as a person. They are simply there to help you be a full person. Like there's no one person walking right now that is absolutely perfect in everything that they think, say, and do. And so we are teachers of not just subjects and, and you know, concepts and, and we are teachers of life. And so we have to help them be confident in who they are and where their life is going, where their life is right now. So, I mean, I can go on and on about this, but make it life, make it life applicable, show them the why and make it engaging. I love that. Got all my, my little notes. I love it. Okay. I, I think for, for me, I, my focus is um, humanities. Um, so with that, humanities, uh, for, first of all, a lot of times people go, humanities, what is that? <laughs> it's a very, I, I answer that question a lot. You have an idea. Um, but humanities, we're looking at um, literacy, English, um, literary composition, understanding literature, literature analysis, social sciences, music, art, history, all that. Um, and for me, one of the things that I think is important, and I, you know, all you guys are so so wise. I forgot who said um, that the students shouldn't learn in isolation. I forgot who um, who mentioned it. Yeah, but that I, that's a big one for me. Um, and the reason why, especially when it comes to humanities, this is a big one, is because we learn from other people. Mm -hmm. Okay, we learn from others from their experiences. Um, and and even though, let's say for me, like I, I teach humanities courses and I'll go through and I'll read the book. It's highlighted. I've done all this stuff. I've been through all of these classes and I've got this degree and that degree. And then I'll be in a class with a kid and a kid will say something about a book that I've read many times. And I go, hmm. <laughs> right. Because they're coming at it from a different point of view with different life perspectives. So especially when it comes to the humanities when we talk about history history is one of those things that um a famous quote is that history is told by the victors so we need to be careful about where we source our material from who wrote that material why are they saying the things that they are saying mm -hmm. um and then beyond that we need to make sure that we get our kids around others who can give them life perspectives that are outside of our own because mm -hmm. the reality is I think it's Sister Mir who was talking about getting them ready for the future, things being being the world that's going to be for them. The world is not the isolation that we have anymore. This is a global community. You know, I have friends. I have a friend. She's in Japan right now and she's posting all of that stuff. She gets a global perspective on life and it influences who she is. We, mm -hmm. we don't, we're no longer just in our little communities. Our kids will interact with the world at large. So mm -hmm. we need to prepare them either for, for interacting with it or honestly, I'll be real, um, as we teach our kids, as Lorraine said, we teach our kids what we want them to learn. There are certain qualities and things that I have instilled within my sons that I want them to take forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I am okay with them seeing people who are different so that I could go, that's, this is why we are the way we are. So, and people will see it. My kids, if you meet them, they're going to open the door for you. They're going to hold it open like gentlemen, because that's part of the things I want them to yeah. learn how to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's the exposure to different ways that shows them, oh, okay. And it'll either reconfirm and affirm who they are or to allow right. them to grow into who they're going to be. But either yeah. way, it can't be done in isolation. Right. So that is, is one of my, hopefully Sister Mir, she's so deep, hopefully she'll come back. Um, let's talk for a second. Does anybody have anything else they want to, to add before we talk about pitfalls? Okay, all right. So let's think about some pitfalls that people may have. Things you see, and you've been through it, like Miss uh, Lorraine, she she's like <laughs> second generation. So I know you see a lot of times people do this stuff. And you're like, you ever saw that meme with the guy with the cup, the red cup, and it's like a group, and they walk away, and he walk away, go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure many times you've had people do that. So let's talk about some of pitfalls, okay, Miss Lorraine? I'm going to start with you, okay, and then. What do you see people doing? If you could give them a warning right now and say, mm, wait a minute, pump your brakes, hold on, what would you tell them? 
Stop looking at other homeschools and other homeschoolers. I see it all the time. And, you know, people um, like we had all kind of put together. If, if you do, it's, it's one thing to gather information. It's one thing to see how other people are doing it for mm -hmm. hints or maybe even a jumping um, point for your creativity. But please, please, please do not compare your family, your homeschool, your talents, your gifts, what you're bringing to your homeschool and to your children with, with what other people are doing. Your Their gifts mm -hmm. are not your gifts and your gifts are not theirs. You know, um, again, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You know, we don't know what the struggle is in that homeschool. And a lot of times when we compare, we're only looking at for what we think is, is better than us. You know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're not looking at the whole picture. We're not looking for the reality, the whole, the whole big picture. You know, we're just looking at the things and, and unfortunately we use comparison to kind of beat ourselves up with. It's hard enough, you know, you're, you're now the principal, the vice principal, you're the guidance counselor, you're the kitchen lady, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the cook. You're, you're all, you're the janitor, you're all of these things. Give mm -hmm. yourself a break understand that this is not going to be an overnight process. You're not going to be perfect from day one. Um, you know, give, please give yourself an opportunity to, to, to grow and to perfect and to, to, to become, to, for your vision to become reality. But yes, that's one thing that I do see a lot. Um, well, they use this curriculum, so I'm going to use it. Well, they do this and they're, they seem to be okay, so I'm going to do it this way. They homeschool first thing in the morning, so I'm going to homeschool. You know, mm -hmm. one of the families that I um, worked with, you know, they were not morning people. And I said, well, you know, it's okay if you start homeschool at two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if that is where your strengths are, if you all are stronger in the morning, in the afternoon, and, you know, you're, you're thinking on a, a higher level at two, then, mm -hmm. then homeschool at two. You know, homeschool doesn't have to be six hours a day. You know, you, you when you look at how the school breaks down the day, you know, you have one person with 30 students, 25 students, you know, and we got to get them all at the same place at the same time. That takes time. You know, we need to mm -hmm. give them the lunch. We need to give them all of these things. You know, homeschool doesn't have to be a six hour day proposition. You know, so again, you know, uh, take the time to really understand your why, to understand your what you're bringing to the table, um, and and who you're teaching. You know, what what their styles are. Get to know your students, your children. You know, um, and do what works for you. I Not just for working for the family on the other block. I like that. I like that. Very good. So, okay. Ms. Urea, what about you? What pitfalls have you seen? Really, it's it's really what uh, Ms. Lorraine was just saying. Um, I would I would add to what she said. You are enough as the teacher for your children. You are enough. You don't have to look to you know the household across the street or you know wherever the other homeschool is. You are enough for your children. And so don't be afraid. The other thing I would say is don't be afraid to um, take what you see and tweak it to what you need it to be for your children. Um, you're not going to be perfect. A lot of people want to be perfect. They want to be perfect at teaching. They want their kids to, to get it, you know, first time around or at least the second time. It might be 10. It might be 12 times, you know. But the beauty of homeschool is you have the time, you have the capability to go round for round with your child in the way that your child needs it. Whereas in a public school setting, if you don't get it by that first or second time, you're kind of just left to the wolves. And hopefully you pass the class. If you don't, we're still gonna move forward and you'll just have to mm -hmm. make it up in the summer. So um, you are enough, tweak it to what you need it to be and and take your time take your time with it it doesn't have to be this wham bam thank you ma'am type of process that we kind of adapted mm -hmm. or adopted in the public school setting i love that most definitely most definitely we are not comparing ourselves with their schedule okay and sister mira what about you what advice would you give for pitfalls to avoid 
So the pitfall to avoid, um, I agree with what both um, Arita and Sister Lorraine have said, but the thing that I am still struggling with is the overdependence. So where we want to raise these independent learners, thinkers, mm -hmm. and sometimes I myself have just taken over the homeschool experience that when you remove me, there is no mm -hmm. homeschool experience. Right. Mm. So where it's just think about ways as you approach this or as you continue your journey, how can I build in certain aspects of their of my children's homeschool experience that they could do without me, that they mm. could do without me for a week that they could, you know, so even if it's, you know, we start every day with journaling or um, if part of our day is just, you know, reading this particular text or whatever it is. Just think about how this this thing can sustain in your absence. If you have mm. a meeting or you have to go away, like homeschool should not stop. Like in schools, there's substitute teachers. Mm -hmm. If you're not fortunate enough to have a sub, or if you're not fortunate to have a good sub, what's going to happen? <laughs> right? What's yeah. next? So especially for those of you who are starting, I wish I had thought about this because we have a pattern and it's harder to break a pattern. But think about how can you build in, even with your young babies, your three and four year olds, yeah. what, how can I structure our program, our day, our days, our weeks, where if I'm gone, at least this, this, and this can still occur mm -hmm. without my presence. Or even if I choose not to actively homeschool today, like mm -hmm. if I choose not to, if I just want to do this thing, can, can, can my children kind of sustain it? And, and, and proceed without me, with questions. Mm -hmm. But just think about those things. You don't want things to stop because you're not around, not available. Mm -hmm. I like that. You know, it goes with what um, what we were talking about. With uh, Eureka talked about having them want to be their own learners. Yeah. If we if we only want them to learn or build that in them that they're only going to learn when you're right next to us, then they're not going to be built into the type of people who will continue that that learning for the love of learning and we know uh as all of us having run businesses and, and our own things that it's our self-motivation that moves us towards success so we have to start building that self-motivation in them um i think for me one of the pitfalls that i see besides completely agree with everything you guys have um have talked about is People think that uh, homeschool is just the academics, but it is also some soft skills. Um, and that kind of goes with what we're talking about, that self-motivation, mm -hmm. um, understanding how um, that we might fail, but that doesn't mean that we're a failure. Mm -hmm. Understanding how to get along with others. Now that may sound, but because I came from a traditional school years ago, a lot of these kids don't know how to work in a group how to be a leader and how to also allow someone else to take the lead, how not to do all the work themselves. And mm -hmm. when we have opportunities and those don't have to be in the structure of the curriculum mm -hmm. where we talked about things like, you know what the schooling is. I write my mission statement, right? My mission statement isn't for my sons. It's not, I want them to get all A's and be the smartest they can be period. I'm, I'm growing them into being certain types of men. And those things involve social skills. My sons right. are very, you know, loving and open and talks to you. And, and they're not scared if I told them to come in here now and dance and tell people how great they mm -hmm. are. That's how they are. But those are kind of soft skills that you build. And the reality is a lot of times when you look at people who are successful in things that they do, it is the addition of ability and soft skills that they have that allows them to, to do that you mm -hmm. know so i want my sons to make sure i i provide them with all of those um fortunately i am blessed to be close enough to um the organization that hosted this the black homeschoolers of central florida and my boys will be hanging out and doing all kinds of things that'll be academic but also provide so, so uh some soft skills uh, for them. So my thing is to find opportunities. It doesn't mean that if you're not near a co-op, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You find opportunities just like uh, the they're over at L Lorraine's house, the grandchildren. Trust me, 
they they learning some stuff from grandma that's some, some mm -hmm. soft skills mm -hmm. <laughs> while they're over there. So make sure you make the make the opportunities if they're not naturally there. Take advantage of what you have um, to remember that schooling really is more than just academics um, when we're we're building our kids to be successful. Mm -hmm. So this has been a fantastic conversation. We're going to wrap up now. OK, I'm going to come to each of you guys, give a uh, little piece of advice, a little blurb that'll kind of get somebody ready to go uh, on this new school year. Uh, and why don't we also just throw in also now how people can contact you, your business. I will be posting these things and also I'm writing out notes and all that that'll be available uh, for you. Some of us have some specials and sales that if you wanted to take advantage of, you are more than welcome to. Um, so let's go ahead and get this uh, started. Thank you everyone who has joined us. Uh, let's wrap up. Okay, we're gonna start with Sister Mira, okay? Go ahead, words of advice and how to contact you. Absolutely. So again, my name is Amira, the founder of Mathematician Junior, which is an organization that I started an advocacy approach to uh, early math mastery and numeracy. And um, the little nugget is <clears throat> our young children are much more capable of doing more math than expected or even what Common Core and those other things uh, require. So you may want to think about an advocate's approach to math, not only for your young ones, but to help with calculation for your older children. Uh, I can be reached at Amira, A-M-E-E-R-A-H, at mathjr.org. I love to talk to families. I love to talk about your math journey. I love to have these conversations. And most people start off by saying, oh, I have an advocate. It's somewhere in that box. Well, it's time to revisit the reason why you purchased that. Um, because again, as I said, our children are much more capable of doing more math, just having the right tool. So I think you, this was wonderful. I love the conversation that we had here. I have it. So it's been great. Let's go to Miss Lorraine. Okay. A little word of nugget and a little bit about how to find you. Uh, well, some final words is homeschooling is not just about educating our children, but we'll also find that you'll be getting another education as well. Um, and I enjoyed the things that I needed to learn so I can relate it to my children. And um, not just for the academic part, but just, you know, learning the things, the skills that I needed to be successful as, as a homeschooling parent. So it's not just about educating your child. It's also about getting the education you need. Um, so that you can stay relevant and just stay on this journey for as long as you want to. Um, the other thing is know that no effort is ever wasted. Regardless of how this journey ends, whether you're only doing it for a certain amount of time or you know until they graduate, no effort that you are putting forward will ever be mm -hmm. wasted. Um, again, these are life, your children, they're with you for life, you know, mm -hmm. so yeah, not only are you not just teaching for life, but you're, you're, you're building relationship in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. So just enjoy the journey. Um, you can reach me at www.homeschoolbuilders.com. Um, I do offer a free clarity call. So if you are having any kind of issues, if you're still even in the consideration um, stage of homeschooling, if you're new to homeschooling, if you're struggling, if you just have a quick you know, issue mm -hmm. that you're just needing some input on, I do offer a free clarity call and you can schedule it through my website. Um, and I, I would love to speak with you and just share whatever I know. Um, and whatever I've learned along the way. So I've made my, you know, mistakes and, you know, um, hit my bumps. And, you know, if you don't have to learn everything the hard way, don't. <laughs> there you go. That's the truth. I like that. And then um, go <laughs> I'm going to go. My mistakes, uh, you please know. learn, learn from the black and blue marks we have. <laughs> yes, okay. I've now, made it to the other side of the mountain and I want to bring you all over here with me. So there please. you go. I love it. Now, before I go to, um, to uh, Ms. Rita, I just want to say, uh, I I get very invested. Like I do what I do, but I get invested in other people's things. Just so you know, she didn't tell y'all, um, but Math Juniors has a nice discount, right? Don't you guys have a nice discount for for the folks? What was that, real quick? We absolutely do. So we're offering twenty five percent off of not only just our products. We have 
workbooks. We offer, I have a patent pending uh, modified abacus, which is simplified and it's progressive. So it's three in one units, 25% off of that. And all of our on-demand courses are also 25% off for our families out here looking to increase, enhance, and get started with an abacus-based math program. And you guys know I have a big old smile on my face because my son is going to be in that. <laughs> Okay. And Ms. Rita, what about you? What about a, a little nugget you would give and how people can contact you? Well, my name is Arita Stewart and I am with Gifted and Lit. Um, I cannot stress enough, make learning engaging. Um, find the tools that you need. The more methods that you use, the stronger it will stay with the child, your child or whoever else you might be homeschooling. Um, we at Gifted and Lit, we use music. Kids love music. Music is an awesome tool to use to engage them because it not only provides the music, the, the audio, but it also gets them moving. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I recall things based on what I was doing at the time. And so just get your learners engaged. Um, make sure that that you're getting them engaged by how you're teaching, but then also what you're teaching is engaging as well. So that's that's what I would suggest to anybody who wants to be a teacher, who is teaching, who has been teaching. Um, if you would like to get a hold of me, you can always look up the company at www.giftedandlit, and is spelled out, A-N-D. Um, lit.com, giftedandlit.com. You can also email me at a stewart, S T E W A R T, at giftedandlit.com. We also have a promotion specifically for this broadcast. And the code that you'll type in is B as in boy, H, C as in cat, F as in Florida, um, Black homeschoolers. Is it in Central oh, Florida? Central Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five. So you get 5% off of anything that you purchase through the website. Oh, perfect. I love it. And don't, and guys, don't worry if you go, I, I, that was real fast. I didn't get their contact information. All that stuff is going to be posted for you. It's going to be shared, their contact information, how to get onto their, their website, uh, their offer. Uh, all of that's going to be posted for you. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, I'm teacher Yolanda from Education Revolution. Um, my, my nugget would be to always remember that there's not going to be a better teacher for your kids than you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because no one cares more than you do. No mm -hmm. one is more invested than you than you are. No one has been with them or will be with them as long as you plan on being with them. OK, mm -hmm. throughout their life and your life. So don't ever feel like I am not qualified to do this. Your, your love and passion and investment is what qualifies you to be the best person to help your student along their journey um, in life. So for me, um, you guys can reach me at educationrevolt.org if you would like to reach out and contact me. Um, I do teach live lessons um, this year. I have all kinds of humanities classes um, that are really fun and engaging uh, that merge a lot of critical thinking, literary skills uh, with uh, history. And I would love for you guys to join us. I'll put my link. And if you join any of the classes that I have scheduled to start before August 15th, um, uh, you will get 25% off of, of that class, okay? And that's pretty pretty good deal there, pretty good deal there. Mm -hmm. um, but I have classes all year round and am available all year round. I do lots of stuff. And you guys can check out my website at educationrevolt.org. Okay, so thank you guys. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one, no, one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, I do a five-week group coaching for um, – that teaches um, the different things to, to do, strategies to start off your year right and start your homeschool off right. And I partner with Rashida with Black Homeschoolers. Uh, we have a series that's already been set up starting September 13th. And for Black Homeschooler members, there's no cost. Oh, I'll so, be there. <laughs> <laughs> so just get, get that in. So there's no, no cost for it. So even though you'll see a cost on the website, 
do know that as a member of Black Homeschoolers of Central Florida, there was no cost for members. Oh, I love that. And that's a perfect way to end because I want to make sure you guys remember, and we really do thank our host organization, the nonprofit Black Homeschoolers of Central Florida. You can find them at blackhomeschoolerscfl.com. Do remember that they have a big annual event. This organization has been around for over 10 years. It's well established. It's been here and it can provide support. It is open. Even though it's Black Homeschoolers of Central Florida, we open our arms uh, and heart to anyone who would like to join us. Uh, and we have an expo on February 26, 2022, which is free and open to the public and very exciting. If I might say so, because I'm helping the planet and we got some good stuff. <laughs> it, <laughs> and, is, it is really good. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Remember, you can follow up with any questions. Uh, and if you want us to do this again in the future, just let us know. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.